Well, let's get more on DoorDash's big day. Take a look what we should expect Thursday from Airbnb. Joining us now is Ross Gerber. He's president and CEO of Gerber Kawasaki Wealth and Investment Management. And it's great timing to have you on today as well, sir. Uh, when you look at the news today about DoorDash, at one point it was up 92%. I think it closed something like 79% up. Uh, if you look at Airbnb's pricing, Dow Jones reporting now $67 or $68. Was, last week it was something like $42 billion. Are we starting to look like 1999? We totally are. And in fact, I, I had a homegrocer.com flashback today with the DoorDash IPO because hmm. it reminds me so much of homegrocer.com, which was a wonderful business that delivered food exactly like DoorDash from your local restaurants or, or at this point in time, it was really mostly from markets. And, and it was wonderful marketing. They took care of their customer and they went out of business. And, and, and that's what I think DoorDash is. It's a wonderful business for the consumer, um, for the most part, although the service is spotty, and he said he's focused on the customer. I'm one of the customers. I can tell you the service is not that great. And so you definitely need to work on the customer. But the second side of it is this isn't a profitable business. It just isn't. And they, this is the best it'll ever be for DoorDash. We literally cannot go anywhere. So you have to order. It will never get better for DoorDash than it is today. And they can't make money. So how is it going to be in a year when everybody starts going to restaurants again? Well, but look at all the companies that didn't, haven't made uh, money quickly and maybe still don't. You can look at Uber. You could even look at Amazon in a way, right? And people kept buying the stock and they kept going higher. No. No? I, I think Amazon, <laughs> whenever people start comparing stuff to Amazon, <laughs> you got to have Jeff Bezos in the mix, you know? When you have Jeff Bezos in the mix, it's a little different. It's like having uh, LeBron Davis on your team. Um, I, I think it's... I think Uber is another broken company and Lyft is another broken company. And they've taken these like mature broken companies public. So the public can ultimately, you know, cash out the VC owners. And, and, and I give all the power to the VC owners for doing a wonderful job cashing out and making a fortune and building these businesses. But now they're mature businesses that are struggling. And so it would have been nice if they took them public five years ago. So if you sift through, of course, we're also talking about a firm. We're talking about Wish as well on top of Airbnb uh, and DoorDash and this, uh, you know, $160 billion worth of uh, fundraising that we've seen in tech IPOs this year, right? How do you sift through who's going to be around and profitable in six months, 12 months, five to 10 years from now? Because there is a question mark over which parts of the consumer behaviour that's been disrupted by the pandemic will ever return. You say that people are going to go out to restaurants again. Will they do that in the same way and to the same extent that we did 12 months ago? That's a great question. We have did an analysis of what businesses we think will come back even stronger, like casinos and, and live music and other businesses that will never be the same, like gyms and movie theaters, for example. So there's going to be massive disruption in certain areas. But one thing I can guarantee you that will come back are restaurants. We love to go out to eat with our friends and drink with our friends. It's, a, it's an entertainment business, really. And quite frankly, eating the same food at home it's just not the same. I miss the restaurants tremendously, and I think a lot of people do. So I think what investors have to think about in the future is when things go back, what companies the hybrid model will work for and other companies it won't. And most food companies don't want to deliver food. It's not profitable for them. So it serves the market right now, but that's not what they want to be doing. Um, talk to me about Tesla. We had JP Morgan saying that the shares are dramatically overvalued, pointing out the fact that it's up, what, about 800% over the past <laughs> two years. When you talk about technology like what Tesla is doing, when you talk about the monetary policy and the fiscal environment and just the overall kind of, you know, we haven't been here before in the pandemic environment, do you still look at traditional valuations and metrics in the same way? Is it possible to look at growth metrics in, in, a, in a way that, you know, you refer back to historical norms and for it to even be relevant? Yeah, you know, I think that's when you need to start questioning yourself when you start, like, changing your values, you know, like, so that happened in the late <laughs> 90s where we started making up new valuations like price to sales is now more important than price to earnings, you know. But I was like, price to earnings is actually a qualitative measure that matters where price to sales can mean a lot of things, you know. 
Uh, so Amazon's real cheap on a price to sales basis, but expensive on a price to earnings basis, right? So I think that's what you have to worry about. So the Fed has created these enormous valuations, whether it be Tesla or DoorDash, you know, all the, the entire market is overvalued. And it's because of the Fed. And so when you think about what will really hurt these stocks in Tesla included is if the Fed starts raising rates again. So so this party, just like in 2000, what killed the market was Alan Greenspan started raising rates. And it took a, like a year or two of rates rising um, before he killed it. But that's exactly what will happen here. So the economy gets better. And in 2022, the Fed starts raising rates and none of these stocks work anymore. And valuations go back to real P.E. ratios. So so investors have to be really careful right now and mm -hmm. really smart about what they're buying and having protections against the downside. Well, Ross, I think there's a kind of a distinction between people who are investing over a longer period and people who are maybe are not day traders, but they're saying, well, I'm going to jump in here. I can jump in there for six months. I can jump in there for a year because it's absolutely right. The Fed could very well be raising rates in 2022. However, they might be waiting a bit longer than that. That gives people a couple more years to ride this stock market wave. You know, I don't think there's any chance of that. You know, there's so much cash out there and it's just going to be inflationary once people get out again. There's so much cash that they've printed and given to people like we've never seen in history. So the Fed will be raising rates. They're going to have to sop up all this capital and the super high valuations. Now, what I say to people who think they're going to jump in and jump out over time is 99 percent of people don't have a million dollars. 99% of people will not build wealth by trading. It, it is not a way for people to make money in any consistent manner. I've done this my whole life, and I'm one of the few people, I think, that has been successful. And I'm not a day trader. I'm an investor. If I had to buy and sell every day, I wouldn't make money. So I think it's foolish for people to want to run around chasing stocks or betting on sports or or horse racing or lottery tickets if they think that this is the way to build wealth. You save and invest over time in great companies and you'll build wealth, but it takes time. Ross, always great to have you. The voice of reason, Ross Gerber, <laughs> President and CEO of Gerber Kawasaki Wealth <laughs> and Investment Management there with us.